Now you are like the, you're the producer, you've written, you've been, I mean, you're kind of like the person when it comes to the Left Behind movie series who I always want to talk to uh, because you obviously know the history, you're part of the history, you've made the history happen. And I've been hearing these rumors about Left Behind possibly rebooting again, coming back again in some form. What can you tell us about that? Uh, what I can say is that we're we're definitely uh, we're definitely proceeding with the series. We are uh, making more movies. There will be another movie uh, being shot soon um, this year and uh, this summer, ideally. Uh, that's Lord a big, willing, that's a lot big of, uh, revelation. But yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, unfortunately we we've known it for a while. That unfortunately with the uh, the COVID thing. Oh. And uh, the fact that uh, that I'm in Canada, um, and you know we're going to be shooting the movie in the U.S., so you know there's a lot of technical obstacles that have to be overcome. It's hard to know all of the uh, all of the intricacies of of COVID and what the uh, you know the lockdowns are going to cause. But our plan is very much to uh, go ahead and shoot this thing this summer. So, so let me just kind of go back a little bit to the original series, right? <clears throat> the first three films, which Kirk Cameron was in those films. What was sort of the the impetus? How did you how did you end up coming into the project? Take us through the history, because I actually I think people would be really interested to know that history. Wow, that's a long time ago. Um, I, I had a black beard. So <laughs> times have changed, apparently. <laughs> so uh, my brother and I had had a, a TV show this week in Bible prophecy. We were on uh, on TBN and international. It was uh, it was uh, a lot of fun for quite a few years. And during the process, early in the '90s, we made a documentary movie called, uh, oddly enough, called Left Behind. And uh, as part of that documentary. We just had this crazy idea one day of let's go shoot a little reenactment of the rapture right here in our office. So it was like, you know, I've got the camcorder that's this big on my shoulder and uh, and trying to do a video of the receptionist disappearing or whatever it was. I should watch that again. I haven't seen it in 20 years. But it was a huge success. Like people just absolutely loved it. They loved the documentary, the left behind documentary that we did, but everybody was talking about this reenactment and saying, you know, it just made it seem so real, even though it was extremely cheesy, but you know, it worked. And, uh, and so my brother and I were, were sitting there talking about it and it's the kind of things you do with, with brothers that you probably wouldn't do alone where you just say, let's make a movie. <laughs> and, uh, and so we did. We we went out and uh, and and took pooled together all the money we had and uh, and made this very low budget uh, movie called Apocalypse. Um, we shot it in Toronto and uh, and it was an overnight success. And it, it was and and again it was like a non union shoot with no money and and it was uh, it was amazing how well it worked. So we decided let's let's make a sequel. And we made revelation, then we made tribula tribulation, judgment, deceived, and we were having great success with these end time movies. And then that's what led uh, led the the people who had the rights to left behind movies to come to us um, to make it. And so, of course, we we agreed to do it, and uh, and thought this is this is a great opportunity, uh, way greater opportunity than we knew at the time because the books weren't a huge success at the time. Oh, so the books um, hadn't the books hadn't really blown up yet at that point. Not to the, I mean, obviously they've been correct. huge, you know, over the years. That's interesting. That's really yeah. interesting. Were you surprised yeah. by as you were making those films? Like it starts out, you're with your brother, you're doing this, and and then it's film after film. Were you shocked by the reception to those movies and the interest that people had in the end times? Oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. I was uh, I was blown away. I mean, I knew there was there was interesting stuff, and I knew that people would enjoy it, and I knew we'd had success with the previous movies, but this this one went to a new level because, um, you know, the books exploded right while we were trying to get the thing made, and so, you know, but when when we agreed to do it, they weren't bestsellers. When we released it, they were bestsellers. And uh, and the movie was an incredible success. We were the number one independent film of the year. Um, we we beat Toy Story in uh, 
in video sales that, that Toy Story 2 that came out at the same time. So, wow. yeah, so it was an enormous, uh, an enormous success and, and a real blessing. And, uh, and I'm thankful to this day for it. And I still love the, the original Kirk Cameron movie. I, I still love that movie. No, I mean, all three of them. When I was in college, we used to show them, you know, like we'd have movie nights, right? We do like Bible study movie nights and people would come, people would come who were not Christians and they would come in and they would watch. It was really interesting because it was such a conversation starter, right? I mean, and it's, and it's like, oh, we're just, we're going to have a movie night. We're going to watch Left Behind. And you'd get like 30, 40 people showing up to watch these films. And then they would talk about them after. I mean, there's something about, I think a lot of people, they kind of need the end times demystified, right? It's confusing to them. They don't really know what to make of it. Um, it's a lot of, it's the same with spiritual warfare and other, in other topics in the church. Uh, what has attracted you to the end times? You Again and again, obviously for decades now, you've been making these movies, you've reapproached this topic. What, what was it at first? Let's start with like the history of it. Cause you had the TV show, then you did the movies. What piqued your interest about this and why did you feel like, Hey, this is a, this is a topic that as a filmmaker, um, and as a, a TV host, you wanted to go into. Well, I, I think the, the main thing about prophecy was that prophecy uh, attracted me uh, in the first place. And my brother was a uh, my brother was a had become a Christian in his early 20s. And we were living in, in different cities here in Canada. And he was he had started a, a newsletter, this prophecy newsletter. It was called the Omega Letter. And he was trying to get subscribers and, and that kind of stuff and trying to build it up. And he's running this little printing press in my parents' basement. Um, and so he kept calling me and trying to get me to quit my job in Toronto and move back home um, to do this thing with him. And, you know, I really, I really didn't want to because I was, you know, I, most of the time I was just making fun of him um, and, his, uh, and, and this cult he was starting. So, but eventually, you know, we had lots of conversations on the phone and I would help him just with, you know, marketing stuff and, and, uh, and direct mail letters and those kind of things. And then, uh, you know, the more, the more I did it, the cooler I thought prophecy was, and it was just, I, I couldn't get enough of prophecy. And I, I would, I remember thousands of times saying to, to Peter that, you know, I love this prophecy stuff stop talking about Jesus. I, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I'm not here to change my life. I'm, I'm not here for any of that nonsense. But this prophecy stuff is cool. So let's try and keep the focus there, keep the focus there. And, and you know, that went on for, for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, eventually, for me, at least, it, it just became overwhelming. And I know a lot of people say that, uh, that uh, a spiritual awakening, you know, isn't an intellectual thing. Um, but for a lot of people, it has to be, it, 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 you know, if you're not ready for the, for the giant leap of faith or you're not, you know, uh, on your deathbed or something, or the no atheists in a foxhole thing, you're just living your life. Uh, I was living in the days of Noah and my brother was building an ark and I was enjoying selecting the wood. I had <laughs> no expectation that it was going to rain. So, and then, was, and then that was, was for so for you, th that's really interesting to me. Prophecy for you was sort of the pathway into faith. Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think a lot of people will say, "Don't start with prophecy; it'll freak people." You know, it'll freak people out, or don't start with. But it's interesting because for you, the more you got into it, the more it made sense. The more it led you into that conclusion of, "Wait, maybe there's more here in general in Christianity, right? Maybe it's not just the, like this prophecy thing. If it's true, that means the rest of this is true. Would that be sort of an accurate depiction of your?" of your journey. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That is, that's exactly what it is. And, uh, and, and that's exactly what we need to do. And, uh, you know, yes, some people say, don't, don't start with prophecy because it freaks people out. That depends how you present it for one thing. And yes, there are, uh, a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of problems with prophecy. Uh, one of the big problems is, pro you know, first of all, prophecy teachers not agreeing with each other. And that makes people think, that therefore there's nothing, there's no real truth here. It's just everybody trying to interpret this mishmash of heads and horns and beasts and, and nobody can seem to agree. And that's simply not true. Um, but people, you know, people are, are 
battling with each other, the pre-trib and post-trib stuff just just makes me sick to my stomach. The, the, the way, you know, even on our Facebook page, the minute you come on and say, oh, we're excited, there's going to be a new Left Behind movie, you know, one of the first comments is going to be, this is all heresy, it doesn't matter. Right. You're, you're not going in the rapture. There's, there, there's no pre-trib rapture. And it's like, we, we, don't have to, we don't have to focus on that. First of all, if, you th- if you're a post-tribber, you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, and the rapture happens tomorrow, you're going. Don't worry about it. You're going. <laughs> you're you, don't, go. you don't not get saved because you have a different belief about the timing of the rapture. Right, they're not um, salvation it, issues. That's the but people argue about them like they are correct. salvation issues. It's very strange correct. to watch. It is it is very strange. And it's uh but you know, it, it's the way people are. And then if you if you ask somebody that, the answer is going to be, well, you're you're gonna be deceived because you know, you're gonna be waiting for the rapture and the antichrist is gonna come and you're not gonna recognize that it's him and all this nonsense, and and it's just not that's you don't have to you have to get right with God not get right with prophecy. Um, prophecy well, is very cool. Prophecy is very interesting. Prophecy is extremely fascinating. And prophecy is uh, an extraordinary proof uh, that God is who he says he is and, and that the Bible, uh, the predictions in the Bible or the prophecies in the Bible are actually accurate. So I, I think it's a great thing. And you know what? If, if it says, if someone said to me, you know, don't start with prophecy, it freaks people out. That my job is to freak people out. You have to freak people out. I mean, you're you're building an ark, and the rain is coming, and everyone's you know Noah. If you see Noah, he's a conspiracy theorist down there. They so, said, "Well, I haven't I haven't heard what Noah's saying about the rain." Well, that's because it's been canceled off all of the uh, the communication methods that we have here, and that's, I mean, so what? This is the truth. This is, and and and. It can't hurt you. Don't get crazy with predictions. That's what I say to people about prophecy. Don't start trying to make up your own. Um, giving dates, we, like, you know, the whole Herald camping thing with yeah. it's going to happen on this day, which you, the Bible tells us not to do that, right? But yet people have done it and they continue to, to do it. It's very, that's also very strange to watch. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, the date setting, that just, that just hurts everybody. The uh, interpretations that people try and leap to, and you know that's sort of the fine line because if you think about uh, you think about any any prophecy. So if if we had a prophecy that was uh, in those days, uh, a great bird is going to cast a shadow over the land. So there you go. Now everybody gets to sit down and say, okay, what's this bird? The if you don't have the context. You're, you're thinking, you know, what, what is this, what is this thing? What, what is this bird? It, it could be anything. It, it could be an airplane. You know, someone might say, oh, it's an airplane uh, carrying nuclear weapons. Or somebody might say, oh, no, this is obviously uh, Larry Bird um, that they're talking about. So, you know, look, look what he just said uh, on TV the other day. Or, or it could be turkey. Um, someone might say, oh, the great bird, that must be turkey. The fact is, you don't know. There is no, if there's no actual reference elsewhere in the Bible where it says what the bird is, then you don't know and be careful when you're making it up. Now, there's that fine line, as I was starting to say, where, you know, there's nothing wrong with with speculating. There's nothing wrong with looking and saying, well, this is interesting. There's, uh, There's a new country forming in the Middle East called Flamingo. Well, great. Now I've found the bird. I, at least I think I found the bird. Um, let's let's explore oh, you have that. Multiple options now. You have multiple options yeah. for who the bird yeah. could be. <clears throat> do you, when you're making movies, right, about this, because you've done this a lot, how do you balance that, right, of taking what <clears throat> you know to be in scripture, what is speculation, and putting it into obviously a fictional storyline that's trying to, in some form, look ahead? What's that balance of doing all? That's a lot of things to be happening at the same time. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's very true. I think that the key is not getting uh, not getting too specific. I mean, that that's the bottom line. But the the prophecies of of the last days and and 
and the, the the entire tribulation are actually pretty clear. You've got you've got the milestones there, and yes, you can take liberties, and and no matter what you do, people are are going to say you did it wrong. Um, so you have to you kind of have to get used to that. And and when you make low budget uh, Christian movies, um, you get you get pretty thick skin um, over time because you're always going to be doing something wrong. And uh, you know, with with our two Left Behind movies, the Kirk Cameron movie, all of the complaints were, this is not a movie, this is a sermon. You, you just, you're just calling it a movie, so I'll watch it, and then all you're doing is preaching a sermon. Then I do the Nick Cage movie, and it's like, this isn't a sermon, it's a movie. Where, where's my sermon? <laughs> and so it, it becomes a real challenge because you're trying to reach both uh, unsaved people and, and saved people. And with the first movie, we said, you know, this movie is a great way to share prophecy with your unsaved friends and loved ones. So get them to watch the movie with you. And, and, and that's the approach. When we did the Nick Cage movie, I had wanted to do it differently and cut out the middleman and say, let's see how many people we can get to go watch a rapture movie without calling it the return of Jesus. Because if we had named it Left Behind the Return of Jesus, then you would just have the God's Not Dead audience and the original Left Behind audience there. We right. we wanted to say, hey, here's Nick Cage in a in an end time, or in a apocalyptic thriller. Um, and so more people can say it, see it. But that annoyed a huge chunk of the Christian audience, which was there's no altar call, there's no anything right, right. That, that wasn't its point. And so so I mean, different dynamics. That's hard. That's that's yeah. tough to balance. Um, you can't balance I almost want to ask balance. you how you're going to you can't balance it. So you almost have to do no. one or the other. So I don't want to I don't want to put you on the spot. But how do you approach the next film then with that in mind? Well, we're back. We're back to the books. Um, you know, we're 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 back to the books. The the Nick Cage movie, you know, it was based on the books in that it was an airplane and there was no real description of what went on in the airplane. So yes, we took liberties, but it was still that. But for this uh, for this movie, we're we're back to the story in the books. Yeah, well that that'll be interesting to kind of get back into the into the books in that way and uh, and see how that goes. I'm I'm really excited about that. What what has kept you? So I, we asked we talked about what like brought you into it, and it was interesting to hear how prophecy kind of was your was your way in right your way into faith what has kept you interested in prophecy i mean it's almost like a silly question because of everything that's going on but what has kept you interested in this arena and wanting to move forward into other films about it i think it's because the uh prophecy exactly as prophesied is uh is like the birth pains birth pangs and uh where where the events um, prophesied for the last days are, you know, closer and closer together and, and more intense as you move along. And so, you know, you, so you have to do your homework. And, and that's what we're all going to have to do. We're going to have to do our homework. And that starts with knowing uh, what the Bible says about the last days, knowing what the Bible says about the tribulation. And, and people say, well, who cares about the tribulation? I'm going to be gone. Um, well, that's certainly, uh, that's certainly not what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, you know, to watch for the signs of the times. He said, you, you don't have to be overtaken like a thief. There's there's a reason for that because we're supposed to be watching. He gave us the signs and he told us to watch. I suggest we do it. People say you don't need to teach prophecy. Well, Jesus taught prophecy. So, right. you know, yeah. that, that's and not himself necessarily a was a fulfillment thing. of multiple hundreds exactly. of prophecies. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And and a third of the Bible um, is yeah. prophecy. That's an awful, an awful waste of paper if we're not supposed to read it. Um, yeah. it you know, I, I've often I've often said that when you look at Ezekiel 36 to 39 and you look at what's going on there and you think about Israel in 1948 and, and everything that that happened, it actually becomes one of the biggest challenges to atheism. In my view, you know, when you when you're reading through it and you're sort of looking at, well, how is it possible that this person could have written this twenty nine hundred years before it happened and everybody had given up and thought, no, this must have been symbolic or something because Israel hasn't come back in over you know, 2,000 years. And then suddenly 
you have this moment happen. And there's so many things like that in scripture, but that one in particular really stands out to me. And I think about your story again, of, of all that evidence, right? Of the things that you were encountering while you were telling your brother, you know, I don't want to hear about Jesus. Like, let's talk about prophecy. <laughs> and that's why teaching it actually does, you know, understanding it, you know, and it doesn't mean like date setting and being obsessed with it. Those are all the things that we know we shouldn't do, but studying it, understanding it and, and continuing to do that, seems to be something that we should be doing as Christians. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. And 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 yet people aren't and we have to recognize the challenge also that it, it people aren't going to suddenly become more interested in prophecy. They're going to become less interested in prophecy. And they already are less interested in prophecy and it seems like the more and the more blatant and obvious and irrefutable prophecy becomes, the less attention people pay to it. Final question for you. And this is a question I've been asking everybody lately. So I'm going to put you on the spot with it. It's not that tricky of a question. You know, legacy, which is one of those strange words. I think most people, they kind of either roll their eyes at it or some people, I guess, like talking about it. But we've talked a lot about your interests, your career left behind, how you got into that. When you think about what you're doing, I mean, there's a whole ministry component to what you're doing. I mean, you're filming, you're making films, but there's this ministry component in that you're trying to get people to focus on a topic and talk about a topic that is essential and important, and you're doing it through film. And actually, I would argue everybody, not to go on a TED Talk here, but everybody in Hollywood actually has their own ministry. It may not be a Christian ministry, but they're all trying to make people think something or believe something and impact a worldview. And so when it comes to you personally, when all is said and done at the end of the day, when people look back on you and the work you've done, what are you hoping that legacy is? I think the important thing for me has always been pay, pay attention to prophecy. It's there for a reason. We've got it for a reason. Um, there's a lot of reasons to, to understand it, but the biggest one, and, and this is kind of, you know, my, my, my thing has always been about uh, you know, sharing prophecy and making prophecy, uh, quote unquote, available um, to people that they can understand it. People who don't want to sit and read the the big fat John Walford book about the Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Um, that stuff can get pretty dry. And yes, there's people who are, you know, digging into that. But I like trying to find ways to make it accessible to the everyday people, the people that you, you know, you meet at a, a dinner somewhere and you start telling them stuff about prophecy and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, does it really, it really says that. There's good stuff there. We, we can use that stuff, but stop scaring people away before they even get a chance to hear it. And the bottom line is for, uh, for the last days, the challenge is if you don't know the truth, you will believe the lie. Not you're at risk of believing the lie, you will believe it. There's only two choices. It, this is very, very black and white. You believe it, yes or no. And if the answer is no and you don't know the truth, then you're going to be deceived. And, uh, you know, there's lots of people with the form of godliness, uh, but denying the power thereof. Those, those are the people who, who go to church, uh, quote unquote, religiously. And, you know, they think, so when you say, you know, how many Christians are there? It says, well, 70% of Americans are Christian. <laughs> Nonsense. Not, not by any definition I know. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of full churches five minutes after the rapture. Well, I or appreciate you sharing. <laughs> five seconds. Yeah, people will run into church after that. Uh, well, listen, I appreciate you sharing that. And that's a good legacy, getting people to focus on. And I, I love that. It's a simple one. You know, you're pointing people toward a topic that they need to be talking about. Where can people go to follow for updates on Left Behind if they're interested in knowing more about the film as you guys inch closer to it? Uh, well, well, we'll have stuff on on cloud10pictures.com um, that we'll we'll keep updates there. Uh, the Facebook page, um, I think it's Facebook dot com left behind the movie um you'd think i'd know after seven years but uh <laughs> uh so on the facebook page is here's where we'll be dropping a lot of it but i do encourage people to uh to go to the website and we're going to get it set up this week i hope um so that people can sign up because uh you never know when you're going to wake up one day and somebody accidentally tripped over the facebook card and shut down 
um, shut down your reach. And, you know, when I think about, uh, about prophecy, a big part of, of prophecy is the new world order and the rise of the Antichrist. The new world order means globalism. And as soon as you start denigrating globalism, you, you become a public enemy. And so, you know, it's not, I'm not going to come out and say so. And so I think so and so is the Antichrist, but I don't think you have to. And uh, so I think we need to start building up our alternative roads of communication um, before it's just suddenly gone. But that's, that's for now, left behind uh, on Facebook is probably the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. I always enjoy it.